because Chris, by saying that, it makes it more okay for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it's okay. Uh, the reason why I'm nervous is that I'm used to, talk to talking to bankers, and um, I rarely do talks outside of the bank in the real world, you know, so it's a little bit <laughs> So please, please help me out, right? So, so if you want to nudge me, uh, so like, like, what the hell is that? Just show it, okay? Uh, I'm also nervous because uh, uh, two, two of my colleagues are here, and actually my former manager is here. So if I'm bullshitting, they can tell. So look at them if you want to know if I'm talking bullshit. Actually, one of them, Derek, he's an expert in bullshit, so he can tell. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm nervous because I was told I have very little time. Actually, this, this talk that I'm, I'm going to do normally uh, requires at least 45 minutes to an hour, and I have 15 minutes, so that's why we don't have the questions during the talk. I hope it's okay. Um, so please bear with me, I'm going to go very fast. So I work for ABN AMRO. My name is Martin. ABN AMRO is very big, 24,000 people. And within ABN AMRO, I work for a department of compliance. So who works for a large company? So you know about this department, I suppose. <laughs> Basically, it's our job to make the bankers behave. Right? So the bad news is, is that this is really quite a challenge. I think you can tell, especially when you're Dutch, that uh, there's a little bit of a trust issue with bankers. Uh, actually, we have a regulator, somebody from regulator sitting here. You can probably also tell uh, that there's that we have a challenge, right? But it's also good news, uh, because at uh, ABN AMRO, uh, we have uh, quite uh, some momentum to do things a little bit differently. And actually, uh, it's a movement, and it's actually started by Bies Wagner, she's here, uh, where we try to hack, basically, the way we think about compliance. So rather than talking about, guys, these are the rules, we're going to explain it, sit still, we're going to explain it, and if you don't follow them, basically, you get reprimanded or fired. Now, we look at how can we make uh, create a context that helps people think for themselves and do the right thing. So I hope you see that this is a very different approach. I think this started maybe five years ago or something like that. Yeah. So, um, and within this movement, I'd like to call it, uh, uh, I'm responsible for uh, educating bankers, yeah, so all these e-learnings that, uh, that people have to do, but also other ways of uh, educating bankers, trainings, awareness. So that's sort of my realm within this, uh, within this movement. Yeah. So, um, what I would like to talk about is, um, so we have all these rules, but really how do you activate them? Right? So it, it's one thing to put them out there, to make them available in a nice policy, but how do you activate, how do you, how do you make it come alive? So that's basically what I'd like to talk to you about and hope, really hope, <laughs> that's going to make sense to you. Yeah, so very quick. Um, so how do we make bankers behave? Well, when you talk about making bankers behave, you talk about what do we expect from bankers? So, rather, so we're already moving to this direction where we say, okay, it's not only about oh, I'm standing in the way, sorry. Um, so not only about following the rules, it really should be about doing the right thing, right? How can we help bankers to do the right thing, and how can we help bankers to do things the right way? Yeah, making sense. And at the end of the talk, I will fill in two other things that are more uh, that that are helping to activate these very important two expectations. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to call it nudging. I'm not a behavioral scientist, but if you do, if you want to do it, fine. Yeah, so I'll fill in. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll start uh, doing that uh, by uh, means of a metaphor. And um, I hope that some of you might have heard about the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, who has heard about it? OK, so for those of you who haven't heard about it, very quickly, it's, it's the year 1799. Uh, the army of Napoleon is marching into Egypt. Uh, they do some conquering stuff. Uh, I imagine they stumble <laughs> across a stone, really. In, a big stone, uh, and this seems very insignificant, but when you have a look at it, it turns out that on this stone is written in three different languages, the same text, and of course they found out later. And the first text on the top is hieroglyphic script, and at that time, we, the Western civilization, could not read that. Huh? We saw all these really nice temples, and we were like, it looks beautiful, and probably it's very important, but we don't understand anything about it. Yeah? The middle one was called Demotic script, an ancient Egyptian script as well. And the bottom script was ancient Greek. And by that time, the Western civilization could pretty well uh, translate ancient Greek. So by means of this stone, all of a sudden, all these weird hieroglyphs could be deciphered. Very, very significant historical moment. For those of you who know the stone, I hope I'm doing it well, this story. <laughs> I hope there's no historians. 
Anyway, it doesn't matter because the, the thing I'm t the point I'm trying to make is that for a bank and actually for, for any large corporation, we need a Rosetta Stone. Because if you look at these three different languages, I think they're also present within an organization. And you could say that the hieroglyphic script could be the script of the rules. Uh, all the policies, and I think in Abiramo we have 10,000 pages of policies, yes, something like that. <laughs> and what I'm trying to make is that's written in hieroglyphic script. We cannot <laughs> decipher it, so it's too much. We look at it and think that looks important, it's very big, but, but, but how do we use it? Uh, totally not activated. And then the bottom script, the ancient Greek, the most common language of the Stone of Rosetta, is the commercial language, right? So the business language. It's about cost, benefit, about being successful, that we understand. Huh? So no problem there. We're very good at it. It's a primary language. And then the middle one is the human language. So the demotic script is the human language. It's the language we hopefully talk at home. Right? So we talk with our uh, parents or our kids or partner. We talk the human language. I hope that makes sense. And I think it's, we, there's a big opportunity to make bankers and any employee in large organization more mobile between these three different languages. And to, to make sure that compliance people, people like me, don't only keep on talking this Rick's language and say, I'm going to explain you one more time. <laughs> and the bankers are like, yeah, but you're talking hieroglyphic script. Why are you talking to me? You see? So I hope that we can make this, uh, more people more mobile between these three different languages. And really, these languages also function as frames, if you like. I think this is maybe a term that you're familiar with, framing. Again, I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> so I hope I'm doing it right. So you have three different frames. So these three different languages provide three different frames of thinking. Yeah? Where the, 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 the frame, the regulation frame, is telling me be legal, comply, yeah? apply to the law, uh, for a bank, avoid fines. And for, for, for an employee, don't get fired, you know? That's, that's what it's telling me. Yeah? The bottom language is telling me make money, be successful, you know? Get a promotion, be in control maybe. Yeah, so that's the commercial, the professional frame, that's what, what it's telling me. And the middle frame tells me, be good, you know, at home. Yeah, the, this is the moral frame, the moral language is telling me, be good, do no harm, be valuable. You know, so it's very, very different. Yeah, is it making sense? Nodding, that's good. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, you, you, ideally you would want people to be mobile through all these three different languages, all these three different frames. So that would be the middle, right? This is a Venn diagram. This is all frames are overlapping. It's the ideal situation where we want everybody to be. But actually, when you look at large organizations, and this is not only ABN AMRO, I've worked for 10 years at ING, the same thing. So I think it's also for Philips or for Shell, I don't know. This is reality. We are mostly in the frame of being professional and maybe a little bit be, uh, uh, being legal. So there's really a lot of uh, requirements from those uh, two sides. I think the be good frame is not very present. So it's really, we, we talk about, uh, for instance, you could say we, we play the game. You know the rules, play the game. Make sure that you don't uh, cheat or don't get caught cheating. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really the game situation. So um, the be good frame is not very present. So you could say that. Uh, for a, a compliance person or for a regulator, it's very tempting to say, okay, but you know, the, the commercial frame is the problem. Uh, uh, the only thing that counts is be legal and be good. But that's utopia, because we live in a, a commercial world, in a capitalist society, so banks also need to make money. Companies also need to make money. And I sometimes think that if you forget that, you don't speak the language of the professional. So I think there's opportunity here in four. So to make the professional, be, to help the professional be reminded of her or his be good friend, his personal friend. So I hope this image shows, shows that because, <laughs> so if I'm a professional, this is my professional self. This is who I am at work, I wear a tie. This is my human self. Huh? So this, this is where I am in the be good frame. Most of the time, this is my primary, primary frame. This is where I'm in the be professional frame. But really, in the, in the ideal situation, you want who I am as a professional to be a subset of who I am as a person, right? Not something else. It should not be the case that when I leave my home and when I put on my tie, I enter the door into the office, I'm somebody else, right? That's sort of schizophrenic. 
But really, when you think, when I think about it for myself, I cannot speak for other people, it is really a little bit the case. I am a little bit someone like somebody else, maybe with different values at work than I am at home. So this is a problem that we need to solve, I think. So for me, I think it's good if I'm reminded of my human self more in a professional setting. And think about it, because we're trying to activate this in, the, in this, this is a very important concept. So the challenge is that this is sort of again the Venn diagram, but then in reality, we say that we get a lot of pressure from the be legal side. We have all these regulations. It's, it's too much. It's too complex. And actually, the rules change all the time. We have a lot of instructions. We have to fill in a lot of forms, all because of this regulation. It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of pressure there. Yeah. And from the other side, there's a lot of pressure to be successful, right? We have targets, you have to meet targets, and we have very little time. There, the time is incredibly scarce, so it's very tempting. And actually, the good friend is sort of squeezed out of the equation. And nothing good? <laughs> okay, so this is a problem. So we, need to, we, try, we, we, we think we need to fix this. Okay. So we need to sort of make the be good friend uh, at, at least as big as the other ones. Yeah. This is when you talk, uh, I really love the term moral si uh, silence, where people feel they don't, they cannot talk about the be good frame. If you say, uh, there's a lot of pressure from, from commercial side, if you're in a meeting, and when you say, hey, but guys, it doesn't really feel good, there's very little time for that. It's very hard to get attention for that, actually a big project. Uh, maybe you should do a next talk uh, about <laughs> this. Um, so. And then the other situation is also, I think, very interesting because when you talk about this very important middle language, this middle frame, when we talk about what's, what's right and what's wrong, what's harmful and what's valuable, I mean, society is very much talking about this, right? We talk about how we don't want criminals to have access to financial services. We talk about how we don't want to help terrorists finance their attacks. Or we talk about how we want to protect consumers uh, from maybe harmful uh, products. So this is a very uh, moral discussion, very much in the be good frame, very much in the human language. But then when we translate it, in the society, society translates it into rules, to regulation, it moves into the legal frame, yeah? into the be legal frame. Yeah? And then we translate it from a, uh, a law, we translate it into a policy. So we bring it into the common company via this frame, via the, the frame that tells us, you know, just don't get caught, follow the rules, don't get fired. So the spirit of the law is already a little bit more to the background. So we talk now about the letter of the law, like it's written down. And then we, leave, we, we, we trans have to translate it to the professional frame, like right? yeah, it has to be, you have to have time for it, you need to, uh, yeah, professionals need to work with it, so we translate it into instructions. So, that's in, so we translate it to something that relates to the people in the professional frame, yeah? in the commercial frame. And now, the, the, the banker is here, right? So, and we still expect the banks not only to follow the rules, but also to follow, let's say, the spirit of the law, right? We want people to have a moral compass, but it's very hard, but actually, because what we're asking them to sort of reverse engineer this whole process and relate to the spirit of the law. So I think this is weird, and I think this is broken, so I think this should be here. <laughs> this should be directly connected. Because if this is directly connected, I can think of myself as a banker, what interests am I serving? Something that I promised actually to do in the banker's oath. But help me, you know, this is not helping me. I so hope that this is making sense because this, mm. I find this incredible that this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, not only at the AMRO, all it's, it's for all, it can counts for all kinds of uh, regulations. So when, when you talk about norms here, it, if the norms are there, they're inactive whenever they reach the bank. Big problem. Very short, uh, this, <laughs> I try to visualize here, that um, have to is much stronger than want to. So but how I make my decisions is because I have to, and when I have to, I don't want to want them anymore by, def by default, by definition. Right? So have to, if I have to do something, I don't want it anymore. So I think this should be more in balance. So we should tap into the intrinsic motivation of bankers who are, uh, let's say, largely great people, all the ones I know are great. So we, we can tap into this intrinsic motivation to do good and to avoid harm. 
And again, the, the things that we're using right now are not always very helpful. Okay, so I have talked about a lot of problems, and I think it's interesting to also look at some solutions. I don't have time to look at the, really the concrete solutions. Maybe after the drinks I can show something, because I have slides, but I'll be quick. But the solutions are in this direction. I think we have to translate whatever is there in terms of regulations and rules. So again, the legal frame. We have to translate it into something that makes sense in the other frames. Okay? Again, to be able to move these three different languages. Actually, if you follow five simple steps, <laughs> is the sort of the golden rules that you were talking about. In there. <laughs> <laughs> these work. <laughs> uh, so if you, if you just you say, okay, these rules and regulations, they are fine. They tell me what should I do, right? Very important, because they provide clarity. Very important aspect of helping people take responsibilities to provide clarity. This, but really, the policies and the rules, they give answers, right? What should I do? But if people aren't asking the questions, these answers are irrelevant. So what we should do is look for, in all these ans answers, all these policies, look for what, que what questions are they answering? Because then you stimulate curiosity. I think the nudging examples where you say on the bottom of the stairs you ask a question and the, and the answer is on the top of the stairs, people will take the stairs. Is that nudging? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, we have to, so an example could be that if you say when you inform a client about a product, you have to make sure that, uh, that you give them the brochure, you make them sign the disclaimer, and then you're done. But the real question is, does my client really understand what I just told her or him? Right? That's the question that this policy is answering. Yeah, is, so we have a lot of policies talking about that we have to properly inform clients. Uh, like really, uh, 100, 100, 200 pages. But the real question, the real fundamental question is, does my client really understand what I just told her or him? So that, add, that, that sort of adds curiosity to, uh, curiosity to the mix. The next step is, why is it so important that I ask myself this question? Yeah, why does it matter? Because if you know why something matters, you have motivation and the good kind, right? So the intrinsic motivation. So the balance starts to shift. So, for instance, uh, why should I ask myself the question, does my client understand what I just told her or him? It's because I want to avoid this client from buying a product that he or she doesn't need, right? Or I want to feel good about selling this product to this person. Yeah, I hope it's making sense. So this is where we, we, we help people to see the interests that they're serving. And for, uh, fourth step is add, when is it so important to ask this question? Because if I, if I uh, recognize the moment in my real work that I have to pay attention, I can implement it. Um, we were just talking about implementation intention. I love that word, yeah. <laughs> so important that you have, to, you have to be able to visualize. So when do I have to implement this? When is it important that I ask myself this question? Because you add attention on the moments that you have to pay attention. And finally, uh, if you add in the dotted line, for who is it, are these moments important? Because then you add focus. And um, so all the rules you basically insert it in this little machine and codify it in this way, I believe, for the reason of the state here, the user, the end user will have more of this, but also because this is really complex and dynamic. It changes every year, um, it's a lot. It's too much, we have cognitive overload. But really, these questions are, don't, don't change so much. I mean, it's, it's, it will always be important to ask your client, did my client really understand what I just told her? The interests that you serve are also quite um, sustainable. It's not that tomorrow, all of a sudden, privacy is not important anymore for clients. Or uh, tomorrow, people all of a sudden are OK with mis-selling products. Uh, no, this is very sustainable. This will stay the same. And also the moments in my day, as, a, as an advisor, as a banker, I will always inform clients. I will always start new client relationships. So these moments are also quite stable. And also the roles that you have, people selling, people making products, are also quite stable. Three minutes still? Yeah. Well, wow. I'm being flexible. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the point we're trying to make is that we, we, we keep on focusing on this and explaining it again and, and again and again. Well, this is not sustainable. This is what we should be focusing on. And if, if there's one thing that I would like you to remember, if you ever get involved in rules or compliance or those kind of things, think of a broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
think of a broccoli. This is this is my way of, of visualizing a broccoli. <laughs> so if you if you take a broccoli, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a banker now, so this is very soft. <laughs> so if you take a broccoli by the stem, right, and you look at the top, you see this all these small dots, right? So all these small little particles. And you, when you look at it like this from the, from from the top, you think, oh, phew, it's quite complicated. I wouldn't know how many dots there are, right? It's it's, it's quite complicated. So these are the rules. So these are these are the ten thousand pages of policies that we give people in the bank. And then you could say, okay, you know, slash them in half, you know, get out 50% of the policies, make it condense it. But still, you know, it will not, it will not make sense to me. It will not be activated. So the point we're trying to make is, we have to look for the simplicity in the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with me, okay? <laughs> so because all these little dots, they are all connected to a little stem. Right? And every little stem is connected to a slightly bigger stem, and a slightly bigger stem is connected to the, to the one trunk? Yeah, why not? So the trunk of the broccoli <laughs> that I'm holding. So this is the trunk. So this is again the translation process that I just described. The outside is the rules, or the instructions maybe even. Too complex, too dynamic, too much cognitive overload. So the, the, the norms, or the be good frame, the interests that these rules are serving, and actually the questions are here as well, they're a little bit more simple already. And then the moments that these things are important are even more simple. So the, really the, the final point that I'm trying to, trying to make is we should be activating these rules this way. And I don't know if you want to call it nudging or something else. We should be starting with making people, get, getting people's attention. Where does it really matter? Why is it so important? Why is this moment so important for you, Spec? Why do you have big responsibility? <coughs> then help, guide a little bit. If you ask yourself these questions, this is how we define taking responsibility. Ask these questions, take these things into considerations. And then you have activated, and then, okay, then you can provide clarity. These rules can help you navigate answering these questions, and it can give you a little bit of guidance. So I think this way is a much better proposition for people who want to do a good job. And it's, it's the answer to the regulatory overload that all regulators know that's a big problem. Uh, and I think uh, it provides a more human approach to uh, helping people do the right thing and doing things the right way. So the final thing, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to fill in just the, these two blanks. So this is fantastic. We should be focusing on helping bankers or engineers <coughs> or architects do the right thing, help them do things the right way. And there's opportunity in helping people do things for the right reasons. Why? And knowing the right moments. Because that's why you want to build a script to change the behavior a little bit. That's my talk.